Hello and welcome to Eccentric Earth, the history podcast where I'm joined by a guest to talk about a story from history, but they have no idea what the topic's going to be. This week, I'm joined by my friend, Addy Ann Hang. Hello. Thank you for coming back again, Addy. I couldn't leave you without my snark for so long. This week's episode is the first time that our topic actually intersects with current events in the news. These are events that have shaken thousands of people. Events that have been labelled a crisis by the BBC. Kentucky Fried Chicken has ran out of chicken. Gasp! And this is the story of their founder, Colonel Sanders. Harland David Sanders was born on September 9th, 1890, east of Henryville, Indiana. He was the oldest of three children born to Wilbur David and Margaret Ann Sanders. The family was of Irish and English ancestry and devout Christians, attending the Advent Christian Church nearby. His father was a mild-mannered and affectionate man who worked his 80-acre farm until he broke his leg after a fall. He then went on to become a butcher in the local town for two years. Sanders' mother was a devout Christian and a very strict parent. She continuously warned her children of the evils of alcohol, tobacco, gambling, and whistling on Sundays. On Sundays specifically, the rest of the week was fine. Yeah, yeah, no, fair game the rest of the week, but you can't whistle on God's day. Aw, oh, man. Sundays for church in, not for whistling. One summer afternoon in 1895, his father came home with a fever and died later that same day. He whistled on Sunday. <laughs> it's as plausible an explanation as any I found, because there seems to be no reason for him suddenly dropping dead. Sanders' mother obtained work in a tomato cannery to provide for her children, and the young Harlan Sanders was required to look after and cook for the rest of his siblings. By the age of seven, he was reportedly skilled with making bread and preparing vegetables, and improving with meat. Wait, wait, wait. It's considered a skill to prepare vegetables? All you have to do is cut them. Yeah, but it's about how you cook them. If you just boil everything like us British do, it's shit. But if you cook it up nice... We already know not to follow British cuisine. <laughs> and a lot I'll of people have this thing where they can eat some vegetables raw. And he was very good at fi finding the best way to eat the vegetables. You peel them <laughs> and eat them. It's how this shit goes. The children foraged for food while their mother was away for days at a time for work. When he was ten, Sanders began working as a farmhand whilst not at school. He had to get his vegetables somehow. I used to work here on this farm when I was a boy. This was the first job that I ever had. I worked here for Charlie Norris. I was 10 years old at that time. I got $2 a month in my board and room. And I used to room in that uh, room right upstairs there. That's been, what, 60, pretty near 65 years ago. He put me to work back here in the woods clearing new ground. And I, I cleared about an acre, I guess, that month, but there were a lot of squirrels, red birds, butterflies, more things to attract the fellow's attention than they were. And evidently, I didn't clear as much ground as he thought a man or a boy ought to have cleared even. So at the end of that first month, he fired me and sent me home. Said he wouldn't feed me for me. So I went home, took my $2 to my mother, and when I gave her the $2 that I had gotten for the month's work and told her that Mr. Norris had fired me, she gave me a little lecture that I shall never forget. She said, what on earth are you ever going to mount to? You're my oldest son, the oldest of the three children. I mean, you've got no father. I've got nobody to help me and depend on but you. And to think that you're so no count that you couldn't hold a job at $2 a month. Well, the time she got through tongue lashing me, I felt just about as low as anybody could have ever felt. And I made a resolve then that I would never let hours or work or anything else ever interfere 
with me doing the best job as possible. And if I ever got another job, I was sure going to see, prove to her that I was worthy of it. In 1902, Sanders' mother remarried to William Broadest, and the family moved to Greenwood, Indiana. Sanders had a troubled relationship with his stepfather. In 1903, he dropped out of school at 7th grade, later stating that algebra is what drove me off, and went to live and work on a nearby farm. Algebra is evil. Yeah, I, I have to agree. I, I don't understand why they teach algebra. It's It's revenge by the Egyptians. Okay. Because they invented algebra. At the age of 13, he left home. He then took a job painting horse carriages in Indianapolis. That's random. Yeah, that is not as random as it's going to get. When he was 14, he moved to southern Indiana to work as a farmhand. In 1906, at the age of 16, with his mother's approval, he left the area to live with his uncle in New Albany in Indiana. His uncle worked for a streetcar company and secured Sanders a job as a conductor, his third job since leaving school just three years earlier. He had more job experience than me currently. Yes, yeah, his list of jobs is crazy, and this is just the beginning. He's only 16. Later that same year, Sanders falsified his date of birth and enlisted in the United States Army. Yay, guns! He completed his three-month service commitment as a wagoner in Cuba. Wagoner. Yeah, wagoner. Um, essentially a truck driver, a military truck driver. I'm sorry, it's just a funny word. What did you do in the army? I was a wagoner. I suppose it's it's the same way that we say trucker. They didn't have trucks, they had wagons, so wagoner. I don't say trucker, I say truck driver. Well, you're clearly more upper class than the rest of us. Yes. <laughs> I'm so posh. He was honorably discharged in February 1907 and moved to Sheffield, Alabama, where another of his uncles lived. There, he met his brother Clarence, who had also moved there in order to escape their stepfather. The uncle worked for the Southern Railway and secured Sanders a job there as a blacksmith's helper in the workshops. After two months, Sanders moved to Jasper, Alabama, where he got a job cleaning out the ash pans of trains from the Northern Alabama Railroad. Sanders progressed to become a steam engine stoker by the age of 17. That sounds healthy. In 1909, Sanders found labouring work with Norfolk and Western Railway. While working on the railroad, he met Josephine King, and they were married shortly afterwards. They would go on to have a son, Harlan Jr., who would eventually die in 1932 from infected tonsils, and two daughters, Margaret and Mildred. He then found work as an engine stoker, also known as a fireman, on the Illinois Central Railroad. Wait, don't engine stokers usually create the flames? Yes, that's why they're called firemen, because they're men that make fire. That is... Confusing? Kind of yeah. Opposite <laughs> of today. It did throw me when it's like, he's a fireman. And I looked at, had to look it up because it's like, oh, not what we think of firemen. The exact opposite. He actually starts fires and keeps them going. So he's an arson. Yes, but they confine his arson to the engine of the train so it's fine sure let's go with that i'm keeping my eye on sanders during this time sanders studied law in the evening by correspondence through the lasalle extension university with the aim of becoming a lawyer sanders then lost his job at illinois after he got in a fist fight with a colleague he then moved to work for the rock island railroad leaving his wife josephine and the children behind whilst he got settled when Josephine stopped writing him letters, he learned that she had left him, given away all their furniture and household goods, and taken the kids back to her parents' home. Josephine's brother wrote to Sanders, saying, She has no business marrying a, a no-good fellow like you who can't hold a job. But he has been able to hold a job. He's an arsonist. Yeah, he's also had, like, 30 jobs by the time he's 20. He's going through them pretty quick. I don't know, maybe she should get a job. Canning tomatoes or something. Sanders travelled to Jasper, Alabama, where the Kings lived, and hid in the woods near his in-laws' home, planning to kidnap his children when they came out to play. Sounds like a solid plan. When the kids failed to come outside, Sanders, gave out, Sanders came out of the woods and talked with his father-in-law on the porch, then went inside and made up with his wife. When I came back from the army in February of 1907, 
I came to Sheffield, Alabama and went to work in the shops of the Southern Railroad there as a blacksmith helper. I worked there about two months. Then I was transferred down to Jasper, Alabama, where I was to doodle ashes. That's cleaning ash pans of the locomotives from the day before, preparing them for their trip, you know, for the next day. One morning, a fireman failed to show up, so they put me on, the tri on that engine to fire the emergency trip that day. And I did so well that when I come back in, the engineer recommended me for a regular job firing. And I continued firing, and I got an ambition that I wanted to be a lawyer. I thought I could be a second Clarence Darrow. That was in his heyday. So I went to study law at the LaSalle Extension University. Two years later there, you see, I got fired. And so my seniority was gone, and I didn't care to ever railroad anymore. After a while, Sanders began to practice law in Little Rock, which he did for three years. Unfortunately, his legal career ended after a courtroom fistfight with his own client. <laughs> 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 I struggled uh, to find out what the fight was about. I really, really wanted to know what caused him to punch his own client, but there is nothing to say. <laughs> Do you swear to say the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? No. God damn it, Frank, we talked about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just imagine being on the jury in that courtroom. <laughs> Some guy gets knocked out by his own lawyer. <laughs> The, the lawyer wins. He beat up his client. After that, Sanders moved back to Henryville and went to work as a labourer on the Pennsylvania Railroad. In 1916, the family then moved to Jeffersonville, where Sanders got a job selling life insurance for the Prudential Life Insurance Company. I have to ask, do all the cities and towns in this area have to end with the bill? I think so. Is that how you know you're in the southern United States? It is a good indicator. <laughs> Everything ends with Bill. Sanders was eventually fired from this job for insubordination. Did he start a fist fight? It, it does not say he started a fist fight, although I can imagine it was going to lead to one. He's a very violent man for someone who is well known for making good chicken. That's how he started making chickens. He started a fist fight <laughs> with one of them. He then moved to Louisville and got a sales job with Mutual Benefit Life of New Jersey. In 1920, Sanders established a ferry boat company, which operated a boat on the Ohio River between Jeffersonville and Louisville. He canvassed for funding, becoming a minority shareholder himself, and was appointed secretary for the company. The ferry was an instant success. Yes, we now unite the two villes. Around 1922, he took a job as secretary at the Chamber of Commerce in Columbus, Indiana. He admitted that he was not very good at the job, and as such resigned less than a year later. Sanders cashed in his ferry boat company shares for $22,000, which comes to $316,000 in today's currency, and used the money to establish a company manufacturing acetylene lamps. Acetylene lamps. Unfortunately, this company failed after Delco introduced an electrical lamp that it sold on credit. Sanders moved again, this time to Winchester, Kentucky, to work as a salesman for the Michelin Tire Company. He lost his job in 1924 when Michelin closed its New Jersey manufacturing plant. In 1924, by chance, he met the general manager of Standard Oil of Kentucky, who asked him to run a service station in Nicholasville. Another bill. There are too many. <laughs> Welcome to the South in America. <laughs> I've been to the South in America. Is it all Vils? Yes. <laughs> in 1930, the station closed as a result of the Great Depression. Everyone was depressed. Um, yes, I know yes, what the Great Depression I, <laughs> is. <laughs> so I'm sure they were depressed, but that's not why it's called that, honey. My mother is a history teacher. Do you think I don't know what the Great Depression is? In 1930, the Shell Oil Company offered Sanders a service station in North Corbin, Kentucky, rent-free, in return for paying the company a percentage of his sales. Sanders began to serve chicken dishes and other meals, such as country ham and steaks. Initially, he served the customers in his adjacent living quarters before opening a full restaurant. It was during this period that Sanders was involved in a shootout with Matt Stewart, a local competitor over the repainting of a sign directing traffic to Sanders Station. <laughs> what, a fist fight wasn't enough now? 
Oh, he he likes to escalate. <laughs> I just can't believe that it's 1930 and they have a gunfight over a sign saying, come eat at my restaurant. Stuart killed a Shell employee who was with Sanders at the time and was convicted of murder. The bonus of this was that it eliminated Sanders' competition. <laughs> Yay! You've got to look on the bright side. Sanders was commissioned as a Kentucky colonel in 1935 by Kentucky Governor Ruby Lafoon. His local popularity grew, and in 1939, food critic Duncan Haynes, a pioneer of restaurant ratings, visited Sanders' restaurant and included it in Adventures in Good Eating, his guide to restaurants throughout the US. The entry read, Corbin, Kentucky, Sanders Court and Cafe, open all year except Christmas. A very good place to stop en route to Cumberland Falls and the Great Smokies. Continuous 24-hour service, sizzling steaks, fried chicken, country ham, hot biscuits. No whistling on Sundays. <laughs> well, if he's getting in the um, big food critics' books, you know, he's definitely starting to do well for himself with the restaurant business. I I've got a feeling this might be, uh, might be his area now. In July 1939... Sanders acquired a motel in Asheville, North Carolina. The Vills are back. His North Corbin restaurant and motel was destroyed in a fire in 1939, and Sanders had to rebuild as a motel with a 140-seat restaurant. By July 1940, Sanders had finalised his secret recipe for frying chicken in a pression fryer that cooked the chicken faster than pan frying. I just imagine that his secret ingredient is like beating up the chicken. <laughs> Getting into a fist fight with it. Yeah, it's his slaughter method. He just beats them to death. Yes, it keeps them tenderized. <laughs> As the United States entered World War II in December 1941, gas was rationed. And as the tourism dried up, Sanders was forced to close his Asheville motel. He went to work in a, as a supervisor in Seattle until the later part of 1942. He later ran cafeterias for the government and ordnance work in Tennessee, followed by a job as an assistant cafeteria manager in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. It was during this period that he began to have an affair with his mistress, Claudia Leddington Price, who he made a manager of the North Corbin restaurant and motel. Nepotism! In 1942, he sold the Asheville business. In 1947, he and Josephine divorced, and Sanders married Claudia in 1949, as he had long desired. Sanders was recommissioned as a Kentucky colonel a year later in 1950 by his friend, Governor Lawrence Weatherby. After being recommissioned as a Kentucky colonel, Sanders began to dress the part, growing a goatee and wearing a black frock coat, which he later switched to a white suit. He also wore a string tie and referred to himself as colonel. Well, he is a colonel. Yeah. So it's not like he just started referring to himself as colonel. <laughs> It's true, true. It's not like he gave himself, like, his own post. He is a colonel. His associates went along with the title change, jokingly at first, but later in earnest. His look became so iconic over the decades that he never wore anything else in public during the last 20 years of his life. He even bleached his moustache and goatee to match his white hair. Oh, man. In 1952... Sanders franchised his secret recipe, Kentucky Fried Chicken, for the first time to Pete Harmon of South Salt Lake, Utah, the operator of one of the city's largest restaurants. In the first year of selling the product, restaurant sales more than tripled, with 75% of the increase coming from sales of fried chicken. For Harmon, the addition of fried chicken was a way of differentiating his restaurant from competitors. In Utah, a product hailing from Kentucky was unique and evoked imagery of Southern hospitality. If you're white. Yes, <laughs> but that's usually the situation anywhere at this point. Don Anderson, a sign painter hired by Harmon, coined the name Kentucky Fried Chicken. After Harmon's success, several other restaurant owners franchised the concept and paid Sanders four cents per chicken. Whoa! Yeah, it's not bad earnings. I mean, to be fair, if you account for inflation and the fact that you have to sell a shit ton of chicken in a restaurant, that is actually a fair amount of money. Sanders believed that his North Corbin restaurant would remain successful indefinitely. And he was right. But at age 65, he sold it after the new Interstate 75 reduced customer traffic. 
Left only with his life savings and $150 a month from Social Security, Sanders decided to franchise his chicken concept in earnest and travelled the US looking for suitable restaurants. After closing the North Corbin site, Sanders and Claudia opened a new restaurant and company headquarters in Shelbyville in 1959. Damn it, what the fills! <laughs> honestly, I didn't pick it up whilst researching the episode, but we have had a ridiculous number of towns ending in Ville. That should be the name of the episode, a ridiculous number of towns <laughs> ending in Ville's. Often sleeping in the back of his car, Sanders visited restaurants and offered to cook his chicken for them, and if the workers liked it, negotiated franchise rights. Although such visits required much time, eventually potential franchises began visiting Sanders instead. He ran the company while Claudia mixed and shipped the herbs and spices to restaurants. The franchise approach became highly successful. KFC was one of the first fast food chains to expand internationally opening outlets in Canada and later the UK, Mexico and Jamaica by the mid-1960s. That is just so random. Jamaica. Well, the list of companies. Yeah, it's also like he, he's sticking to the north and dipping into the southern part of the Americas and then the UK. It's, it's very central to one part of the world and then the UK. <laughs> it's just like at some point he tossed a dart at a map and said, <laughs> whatever hits. The company's rapid expansion to more than 600 locations became overwhelming for the aging Sanders. In 1964, then 73 years old, he sold the Kentucky Fried Chicken Corporation for $2 million, which today is worth $15.8 million. He sold it to a partnership of Kentucky businessmen, headed by John Brown Jr., a 29-year-old lawyer and future governor of Kentucky, and Jack C. Macy, a venture capitalist and entrepreneur. Sanders went on to become a salaried brand ambassador. The initial deal did not include the Canadian operations, however, which Sanders retained, or the franchising rights to the UK, Florida, Utah, and Montana, which Sanders had already sold to others. In 1965, Sanders moved to Ontario to oversee his Canadian franchises and continued to collect franchise and appearance fees in both Canada and the US. Sanders remained the company symbol after selling it, travelling 200,000 miles a year on the company's behalf and filming many TV commercials and appearances. He retained much influence over executives and franchisees who respected his culinary experience and feared what the New Yorker described as the force and variety of his swearing. Wait, the person who is known for punching people <laughs> is forceful with his swearing? I just like the, the variety of his swearing. I, I can imagine he's coming out with some really creative curse words. Of course, he was in the army. For three months. It's still something. <laughs> when you're in the army, your notion is... Be as fucking creative as possible. Sanders was known to become incredibly angry when a restaurant or the company varied from what executives described as the Colonel's chicken. One change the company made was to the gravy, which mm -hmm. Sanders has bragged was so good it'll make you throw away the damn chicken and just eat the gravy. Please don't throw away the damn chicken, there's a shortage <laughs> now. But when the company simplified the recipe to reduce time and cost, it annoyed Sanders. As late as 1979, Sanders would frequently make surprise visits to KFC restaurants, and if the food disappointed him, he denounced it to the franchise as goddamn slop and threw the food onto the floor. Yeah, he's crazy. He doesn't even own the company anymore at this point. <laughs> however... He's just the mascot. <laughs> however, he's a well-known mascot, and really, would you mess with someone who bleached his own goatee? Yeah, but still, it's like a Ronald McDonald complaining about chicken nuggets and brandishing a knife at you. It's like, you're just going to tell him to fuck off. I mean, I'm not going to fuck <laughs> with Ronald McDonald brandishing a knife at me. Because yeah, Ronald I may have taken McDonald, that too far. <laughs> Ronald McDonald, even without a knife, is terrifying. That That is fair. In 1973, Sanders sued Hublin Inc., the then-parent company of Kentucky Fried Chicken, over the alleged misuse of his image in promoting products that he had not helped develop. In 1975, Hublin Inc. unsuccessfully sued Sanders for libel 
after he publicly described the gravy as being sludge and wallpaper paste. <laughs> what, did they settle it out of court by a punching match? <laughs> he just challenges the CEO to a fist fight. <laughs> I'm going to take you down, sir. It's like, well, well, he's he's 80. I'm, I'm sure I could beat him. It's like, nope. <laughs> Sanders and his wife reopened their Shelbyville restaurant as Claudia Sanders, the Colonel's lady. They served KFC-style chicken there as part of a full-service diner menu and talked about expanding the restaurant into a chain. He was sued by the company for doing this. After reaching a settlement with Hublin, he sold the Colonel's Lady restaurant and it has continued to operate, currently as Claudia Sanders' dinner house. It serves his original recipe fried chicken as part of its non-fast food dinner menu and is the only non-KFC restaurant in the world that sells an authorised version of Kentucky Fried Chicken. Sanders remained critical of Kentucky Fried Chicken's food. In the late 1970s, he told the Louisville Courier-Journal, my god, that gravy is horrible. They buy tap water for 15 to 20 cents a thousand gallon, and then they mix it with flour and starch and end up with pure wallpaper paste. I know wallpaper paste, by god, because I've seen my mother make it. There's no nutrition in it, and they ought not to be allowed to sell it. Crispy recipe is nothing in there that would be a damn fried dough ball stuck on some goddamn chicken. His description is really poetic. Yeah, I like him. <laughs> He sounds like a great person to hang out with. <laughs> In June 1980, Sanders was diagnosed with acute leukemia. He died at Jewish Hospital in Louisville, Kentucky, of pneumonia on December 16th, 1980, at the age of 90. What's the name of the hospital? Jewish Hospital. I'm sorry, that's not a name. It's the name of the hospital. Can we get compensation for that shit? <laughs> Why? It's kind of the name of our people. Yeah. They didn't say, like, bad Jewish hospital. Bad Jewish hospital. <laughs> they, of course they, they wouldn't. Of course they wouldn't <laughs> say bad Jewish hospital. Doctors is kind of one of the only things Jews were allowed to be at the time. <laughs> it's kind of like saying bad Jewish law firm. That shit does not exist. Sanders remained active until the month before his death, regularly appearing in his white suit crowds. Following his death, his body lay in state at the rotunda of the Kentucky State Capitol in Frankfort after a funeral service at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary Chapel, which was attended by more than 1,000 people. Sanders was buried in his characteristic white suit and black western string tie in Cave Hill Cemetery in Louisville. By the time of Sanders' death, there was an estimated 6,000 KFC outlets in 48 countries worldwide with a $2 billion annual sales salary, equating to $5.9 billion in today's currency. A fictionalized Colonel Sanders has repeatedly appeared as a mascot for KFC's advertising and branding ever since his death. Sanders has been voiced by impressionists in radio ads, and from 1999 to 2001, an animated version of him was voiced by Randy Quaid to appear in television commercials. <laughs> There's plenty of folks who'd love to have this. The secret to my original recipe chicken. There's never been a chicken so full of flavor. With my 11 herbs and spices, it's 11th heaven. Get KFC's three-piece feed, served with chips, potato and gravy, a bread roll and a Pepsi, all for just $5.95. At KFC, we're the chicken experts. Because we got the secret. Hmm, what you looking at? In May 2015, KFC reprised the Colonel Sanders character in new television advertisements, with multiple actors playing the role each year since. Members of the WWE franchise have repeatedly dressed up as the Colonel in recent years, with one wrestler, Dolph Ziegler, dressed as Colonel Sanders, beating up a man in a chicken suit in a wrestling ring during SummerSlam 2016. The Japanese Nippon Professional Baseball League has developed an urban legend of the Curse of the Colonel, the curse was said to have been placed on the team because of the colonel's anger over the treatment of one of his storefront statues, which was thrown in into a river by celebrating Hanshin fans following their team's victory in the 1985 Japan Championship Series. As is common with sports-related curses, the curse of the colonel was used to explain the team's subsequent 18-year losing streak. Some fans believe that the team would never win another Japan Series until the statue was recovered. The Colonel statue was finally discovered in the river on March 10th, 2009. 
divers recovered the statue at first thought it was only a large barrel. <laughs> and shortly after, they believed it may have been a human corpse. But uh, Hanshin no, no, fans... no, the barrel is simply the fist. <laughs> yeah. But Hanshin fans on the scene were quick to identify it as the upper body of the long-lost colonel. The right hand and lower body were found the next day, but the statue is still missing its glasses and left hand. It is said that the only way to lift the Colonel Sanders curse is by returning his long-lost glasses and left hand. The statue was later recovered with replacements of new glasses at hand and returned to the KFC Japan. As the KFC branch that the statue originally belonged to no longer existed, the statue was placed in a branch near Koshin Stadium. One of Colonel Sanders' white suits with his black clip-on bow tie was sold at auction for $21,500 in 2013. The suit had been given to Cincinnati resident Mike Morris by Sanders, who was close to the Morris family. The Morris family house was purchased by Colonel Sanders, and Sanders lived there with his family for six months. The suit was purchased by Kentucky Fried Chicken of Japan president Masio Watanabe. Before his death, Sanders used his stock holdings to create the Colonel Harlan Sanders Charitable Organization, a registered Canadian charity. The wing of the Mississauga Hospital for Women's and Children's Care is named the Colonel Harlan Sanders Family Care Centre in honour of his substantial donation. Sanders Foundation has also made sizable donations to other Canadian children's hospitals throughout the years. And that's the story of the founder of Kentucky Fried Chicken. I have to say the most surprising part is that he was actually a colonel and not just someone who got that nickname somehow. Yeah, yeah. I I knew that he had a lot of jobs throughout his life, but I was just shocked at the list of stuff he did. He has had more jobs in his first five years after leaving <laughs> school than I had in my ever life? since I left school. Yeah, my entire life. Uh, to be fair, he got a job without school education. You can't do that now. To be fair, he started a multi-billion dollar company after leaving school at 13. That's what happens when you learn to make vegetables. See, all that practice as a kid, he figured out his recipe. I still love that he punched his own client. That's going to be my favorite Colonel Sanders thing ever. I'm just imagining you going uh, to KFC and it's like... Do you know that the founder of this company punched his own client? And he tried to kidnap his own kids. But he failed. He didn't fail, he just got bored. Father of the fucking year. This is related to current events. It Kentucky is. Fried Chicken ran out of chicken. Hey, the BBC have labeled it a crisis. So... The BBC had a headline <laughs> about whether disabled partners are a burden. Excuse me if I don't give them that much time of day as I used to. Yeah. Disabled partners, are they a burden? KFC runs out of chicken. It's a national crisis. They've definitely gone downhill. Yeah. If you enjoyed this episode, you can follow us on Twitter by going to at eccentric underscore earth. You can also find us on Facebook by searching for Eccentric Earth, and you can find us on Instagram under the same name. All of our social media platforms are kept up to date with news and information on upcoming episodes, as well as being updated with history facts every day. If you want to write into us with any suggestions for topics you'd like to see us cover, you can get in contact with us by using our email address, eccentricearth at outlook.com. You can find our show on all major podcast providers, so make sure that you subscribe so you never miss an episode. And if you like the show, please leave us a review. Thank you for listening, and thank you, Addy, for joining me. And we'll see you all next time. Bye. Bye.